In this installment of Learn to Fly Here, we're going to cover the basic flight instruments, including which ones are required for VFR flight, how and when to set an altimeter, oh, and why we have multiple instruments that do similar things. Every once in a while, you'll hear an instrument panel referred to as a six pack. They're talking about six basic instruments, not a refreshing drink at the end of a long week. And that six pack consists of these six instruments, the airspeed, attitude indicator, altimeter, turn coordinator, directional gyro, and vertical speed indicator. And it's those six instruments that make up the primary flight instruments. First, let's talk about the airspeed indicator. The airspeed indicator gets its air source from two sources, the pitot tube and the static port. The faster the airplane flies, the greater the pressure inside the pitot tube. And the static port, well, it's whatever the outside ambient pressure is. And the greater the difference between those two pressures, the higher the airspeed. Some airplanes have pitot tubes on the nose, some are on the wing, some are on the side of the airplane. This airspeed indicator is in knots. This airspeed indicator will also give true airspeed. All you do is at the top of the airspeed, enter the altitude on top of the temperature, which would be gathered from the outside air temperature probe up above the pilot's head on the front windscreen. And then true airspeed would be read inside that white band at the bottom of the airspeed indicator here. So right, the pitot tube and static port are all in the same place on this airplane. It's this probe over here on the left wing. There's a small hole in the front of the probe, that's pitot pressure, and there's a small hole in the back for static pressure. Next we have the attitude indicator. This is also called the artificial horizon. It's normally adjusted for level flight on the ground, but it can also be adjusted in the air if it's in error. To adjust the attitude indicator in flight, rotate the knob at the bottom until the small airplane is on the horizon on the instrument. This instrument and the directional gyro directly below it both use an engine driven vacuum pump, which spins a gyro. And these are just two of the three instruments we have in front of us that use a gyroscope to operate. Next we have the altimeter. Earlier we talked about the pitot and the static pressure. This uses just static pressure. The higher we go, the lower the pressure. So the lower the pressure, the higher this thing indicates. So as we climb, that's why the altimeter indicates a higher altitude. The altimeter can be set two ways. We can set it off of the barometric pressure given by the ASOS, AWOS, or ATIS. If we don't have that, we can set it to the field elevation where we're at when we start the airplane. The altimeter is read like the hands of an analog clock. The small hand indicates thousands of feet, the large hand indicates hundreds of feet, and the one out here indicates tens of thousands of feet. This altimeter reads 6,560 feet. The altimeter should be set to the current reported altimeter setting of a station along the route within 100 nautical miles of the aircraft. And in the United States, this is true until you get to 18,000 feet then the altimeter is set to 29.92. Next we have the turn coordinator. This uses a gyroscope also, but the gyroscope is spun electronically. And that is done for redundancy. If the attitude indicator and the directional gyro lose the vacuum to make the gyro spin, we still have bank information with the turn coordinator. That's why they are powered from two separate sources. But flying in VFR conditions, it doesn't matter, but IFR conditions, it becomes a concern because if you lose that vacuum pump, you need a source of bank information and the torque coordinator is it. The fifth instrument is the heading indicator, also called the directional gyro. You can see we have two compasses in the airplane. There's a magnetic compass and this heading indicator. The heading indicator does not have any magnets in it. It's just gyro driven. We also have a magnetic compass but it's only really accurate in straight and level, unaccelerated flight. And when we're in straight and level, unaccelerated flight, we can set the directional gyro off of the magnetic compass. But watch the magnetic compass as we decelerate. I pulled the power back, we were on east, now it's on a heading of about 100 to 105 degrees. Remember ANDS, A-N-D-S, accelerate north, decelerate south. When we accelerate, the compass points more towards the north, and when we decelerate, it points more towards the south. Because of errors like that, that is why we have a directional gyro. 
Every 15 to 30 minutes, we need to compare the directional gyro heading to the compass heading and reset the directional gyro. Even though that sounds tedious, it's not. It's a lot easier to do that than to try to figure out turns based off the magnetic compass, which we will get into later. And if you don't want to wait till later, look up a concept called timed turns. Last of all, we have the vertical speed indicator. This tells us our vertical speed up to plus 2,000 down to negative 2,000 feet per minute. This instrument uses that static air we talked about earlier. It has a calibrated leak inside the instrument that lets air out. There's also a diaphragm in there, but to make it simple, it compares the air pressure from a second ago to right now. But of all these instruments, the ones we see in front of us and the ones we just talked about, how many of those are actually required? So for daytime VFR conditions, we need an airspeed indicator, altimeter, magnetic direction indicator, a tachometer for each engine, oil pressure gauge for each engine, temperature gauge for each liquid cooled engine, which we don't have, an oil temperature gauge for each air cooled engine, manifold pressure gauge, which we don't have, a fuel gauge indicating quantity of fuel in each tank, a landing gear position indicator, which we don't have, and for airplanes certificated after March 11th, 1996, you also have to have an approved aviation red or white anti-collision light system. Oh, and while we're on the subject of required instruments, it's not an instrument, but you are required to have a seatbelt with a metal to metal latching device, as well as an ELT or emergency locator transmitter if required. So of all the instruments we talked about, the ones we actually need are these. And if we're flying at nighttime, we need an additional set of lights, approved position lights or navigation lights, which are here. And here's what they look like from the outside. The right wing has a green light, left wing is a red light, and there is a white light on the tail. And if you're looking at the airplane from behind at nighttime, you will only see the white light on the tail. The wing navigation lights are not visible from behind. And remember a minute ago when we were talking about our instruments that use gyroscopes, the attitude indicator, and the directional gyro? Well, we checked suction during our run-up over on this instrument here, which we're going to get into in the next video when we get into taxiing. But to make a long story short, there is a range that the suction needs to be within. If it's outside of that, the attitude indicator and directional gyro may not be accurate. And another one that seems kind of important that you would think we would need at night, the switch for it's right here, the landing light. Do we need the landing light to fly this airplane at night? And the answer to that is no. You do not need a landing light to fly the airplane at night unless the airplane is flown for hire. And believe it or not, yours truly has landed airplanes at night without landing lights because they have burnt out. And I will leave this video with a question. If I know the landing light is burnt out and I'm going to fly at night, can I legally fly the airplane? And if so, what do I need to do? So for those learning to fly, and I know you're out there, that's a good question to look up. Know the answer to stuff like that. And also, if you want more information on required instruments, there are a few things that are not included in this video. You can look up 91.205 in the FAA regulations, as well as 91.213. There's information in there, some stuff that's not in the video, and also things like ADSB that's not even in that section. And as always, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell notification so you don't miss the next video in the series. And if you like these videos, be sure to share them with a friend that has an interest in aviation.